Father, tonight we come to you, and we want to thank you. Father, we want to thank you for the times that you had your hand upon us, Lord, and when we didn't even realize it. Lord, this testimony tonight, Lord God, of how you had your hand on this lady, of how the angels were around her truck. Lord, it protected her during this whole time. Father, how many times have you done that for each and every one of us? And we didn't know it. Lord, I want to thank you, Father, for meeting these needs tonight. Lord, I want to give you praise in advance, Father God, for what you're going to do in each one of these lives, Lord God, that were mentioned. Father, bringing peace, bringing healing. And Father God, for the kids that are going back to school here real soon, Father God, bringing, giving them protection, giving them wisdom. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the love that you have for us, and I thank you, Father God, for the anointing that is on Steve tonight. Father God, I pray that you would just speak through him, Lord God. Lord, that you would minister to us through him, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Steve, come. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in here tonight. I don't know if you guys can feel it. I think it's over here by Keith. I don't know, you guys. Ooh, man. I got the little jitteries up and down my back. I usually don't get, I get the nervous jitteries. I don't get the Holy Spirit jitteries. Ooh, anybody want to dance? Becky, come back. We'll just play a little bit. Ooh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Ooh, thank you for your presence tonight. Oh, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Ooh. Wow. I'm not stalling. I know it looks like I'm stalling, but I am not stalling. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit is so powerful right now. I, I just really, really feel it in this place. Ooh. We've recently changed our, uh, our theme to uh, serving, servitude. And... Uh, <clears throat> I actually messaged Pastor Pastor, because I felt, oh my word, there's just so many good scriptures on this, and and he's going to take my scripture uh, for Sunday, and then I found out he wasn't even preaching, that it was Ryan, so I texted him. But our uh, our scripture that we're gonna we're gonna talk about tonight, it's uh, I'm sure you've read it before, John 12:26, and. Uh, it didn't. It didn't take long for me to find this scripture. Um, it was. It was already on my heart, um, and uh, and it was just. Uh, it was. It was already powerful. I, I think it was powerful from when I was teaching with Brother Tom because I spent so much time in Children's Church, and uh, and it was so hard for me to leave Children's Church and to uh, to be the media ministry and do all that and <clears throat> go from a, kind of a. You know, front up up front and teaching the kids and you know, kind of kind of ministerial pastoral type role for the children to you know sitting all the way in the back. You can't get many seats past where I'm at, just so you know. If you measured it from the from there to here, I am the furthest person sitting from right here. But you know, I still get blessed. So anyway, uh, our scripture is: If any man serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serves me, him will my father honor. Lord, we just thank you for this, uh, this time in your, in your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for this fellowship, Lord Jesus. And just, just touch us as we go through tonight, Lord, that, uh, that your words, these are your words, Lord, and, and not my words. Just, just pour out your spirit on us. In Jesus' name, amen. So... If any man follows me, and if any man serves me, let him follow me. And uh, we all know because we've all been to the basics classes that we we do not get anywhere on our own. We don't get into heaven by our works. We can't work harder to get into heaven. In fact, uh, R.C. Spool says to have sound assurance, we must understand that our salvation rests on the merit of Christ alone 
which is appropriated to us when we embrace his genuine faith. We cannot get there alone. We cannot get there on our, uh, in any way, shape, or form through our works. We can't pray ourselves into heaven. We have our salvation prayer that we have, we, we pray, but we can't pray harder to get, you know, a bigger mansion or a bigger, you know, we can't, we can't work harder. We can't go out to the youth and, and, and help build a, a goat pen, hard, working harder, sweating more for the Lord. You, you can't do that. That is not going to get you more salvation. It's not going to, like, build up or anything. So if, if you know Christ already, you want to serve him. It, it's, it's like all of a sudden it's in your DNA. And, uh, and, and you, you, basically, you can't have Christ and not want to serve him. Your heart just pours out. Your heart just bleeds for that. And we've all read, again, James uh, 2, 14 through 26. We've all had studies on that. I've had studies on that. And, you know, he's, he's very, very specific about that. But one of the things that, that I want you to get here is we're not saved by service. But in any way, shape, or form. But we are saved to serve. You got that? We are saved to serve. We're not going to do any more service that will help our salvation, right? We, live, we had one time we were in bondage to the world and it kept us a slave already to sin. But once we've made, been made free with the sweetness of the perfection of freedom in Christ, we no longer in slavery to that sin, but we still have a new master, the righteous master, Savior Christ, who gives us holiness and his perfect salvation. Once saved, we live in a perfect service for our Lord. If you, and I probably should have saved this for the end, but if you aren't serving Christ, then I challenge that you are saved. It's a symbiotic relationship. The, um, it, it, you can't separate the two. You are saved, and so you want to serve. You, you are saved so that you can rid your mind of those self-promoting thoughts. You're saved so that your heart doesn't have that selfish will of its own. So it goes out and does its own thing. But you have a will to follow the way of the master each and every day. You have the will of Christ. And by definition, isn't that really the salvation? That where you're born again to a new mind and a new heart, a heart and a mind of Christ? That, that just refreshes you and makes you new. In fact, if you refuse to serve Christ then I'm saying that you're not, you're not saved. You're serving yourself, walking in a self-service as simply being a servant for Satan. There's only one way to be delivered from this self-righteous, self-serving, self-willed mindset, and that is to be saved. And that, mu that means you must serve, but instead of serving yourself, being self-centered, you serve Christ. Your heart changes. You want to do this. You're, you, you, you're poured out, and you want to pour more out. You, you just you get that way. In fact, God counted Abraham justified by his actions when he put Isaac on the al uh, altar. In James 2.22, he says, You see, his faith and his actions work together. His action made his faith complete. He, w he didn't just believe it. He went and did it. So that, he, so that he could show that he believed. Three times in our verse it says the word serve or servant. It's a picture of a servant. In Greek it's diakonos, which means someone who literally kicks up dirt in the activity of serving his master. Gets out there and really pushes hard to, and, and gets things going. It's an action word. And the word diakonos, it's the root from which we get our deacon. The word deacon. But Jesus is not just talking about the people that hold the office of deacon that are supposed to be serving. He's talking about anyone who serves. In our verse, it refers to the servitude. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, him my father will also honor. So I'm going to break this out into the three parts that are already broken out in that scripture for you through commas. And I'm going to tell you that there's three absolutes of serving. 
when you serve, you must follow Christ. When you serve, you must be where Christ is. And when you serve, you will be honored by the Father. So first off, when you serve, anyone who serves me, let them follow me. And it took me a second. I had to go, well, maybe we should define follow. Pick up, you know, how does, what is follow? How am I going to, how am I going to chase this, you know, follow? And the Lord kind of dug me in a little deeper than, than I usually do because we didn't, I didn't just define follow as just one word. It, it's not just follow in the direction, but follow my words and follow my example. Follow me into death. To serve means to follow Christ and not yourself. If anyone serves me, let them follow me into ministry. What is your calling? What did God call you to do? You may not be doing what God called you to do. You may think that you're doing something great for the Lord, but if God called you to do something else, I'll show you a scripture down here, then you're, you're not doing the will of the Father. In, so you may actually be working your tail off and sweating and doing all this stuff, but you may not be in the ministry that God's called you to do. You know, when, when we first went into uh, to ministry and, and we started going to these cl classes and we went to the district office, they always asked, what, what, is your, uh, what is your ministry? What, what were you called for? Man, I had a tough time. I had just did a transition from children's church, and I loved the children, loved working with the children, and, and my heart was for the children. I had done mission trips to, to New York, to Ecuador, to Costa Rica. I loved doing that. I would always come back just pumped, um, just ready to do, do anything for the Lord. And... But then I knew God called me to what he gave me a, uh, a skill for. He, get, he knows that I like to play with photo, Photoshop and Dreamweaver and all that crazy stuff. But he also knows that I have a, te a, a technical side to me that I understand the, the computer side of things. And so they needed somebody in me media ministry. God knew that. That's where God put me. It wasn't just my talent or my interest, but that was God's will for me. Believe me, there are times that I question God's, God's direction there, but I know it's his because of how hard it was to leave Children's Church. It just ripped me apart. But it says in Ephesians 2.10, it says, It is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend those lives in helping others. He's already planned what we're going to do to help other people. We, he's already planned our servitude. It says in uh, Jeremiah 1.5, Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. What is that special work? That's determined by you, I mean, and God, and, and you guys get together. I can't tell you what your work is. The district council couldn't, uh, district uh, board or whatever couldn't tell me what mine was. It is what God has called you to do. And most likely you have something burning in you already for it. He knows the plans for you and they're holy plans before you saw the light of day. God knows which way I'm supposed to go. He knows which way you're supposed to go. He knows the direction in the ministry that we are supposed to go. And he knows how long that I'm supposed to be there. My goodness, do not leave a ministry before God has released you from it. I want to do some other great things for the kingdom of God. I want to do, you know, I get this heart and I'm like, oh, Keith, I just want to do these fantastic things for the Lord. I just want to, and maybe that's not my task. Maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to meet certain people at a certain given time, at a, at a truck outside of a, a busy street to, to have a taco and talk to him about Jesus Christ. Couldn't do that if I was doing something else. I'm where I'm supposed to be because God put me there. And even though I want to do these great things for Christ and all that, that, that task that I, that I have, it is going to be great. If it saves just one soul, that is a great task. That is an anointed task. It says in Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices 
as much as obeying the voice of the Lord. In other words, serving the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. You, you can be pouring sweat, chopping wood, stacking it up, doing what you think is for the Lord, but if you're not doing that service because God has called you to do that service, it says right here that obeying the voice of the Lord, serving the Lord, is better than the actual sacrifice that you're given. Doing where, what he wants, when you want, what he wants, and how he wants. Listening to his word. Gui being guided by his word. You're following him. And if you're following him, what does it say? So it says, so I took follow again, and now if anyone serves me, let him file, follow my orders or my commandments. I can only imagine life in the military. I've never been in the military, but I don't know if it counts any. I've watched a lot of military movies, and I've seen some boot camp movies and stuff like that. Um, but one of my favorite movies is not a military movie. It's Forrest Gump. And there's a scene in Forrest Gump that is just a hoot to me. Forrest Gump, Forrest Gump said, shouts out after putting together this machine gun, Gun drill, sergeant! And drill sergeant yells at him, Gump, why'd you put that weapon together so quickly? And Forrest Gump says, because you told me to, sergeant. And that's exactly it. He just had the simple mind. He was going to do exactly what he was told to do. And he was... He put it together faster than anybody else. And I believe that we're supposed to follow Christ, then follow Christ and recognize that, that that's the task that he has asked us to, to do. Do you believe the word of God, every word of it? Then you should follow every command that God has for his given people. Not sometimes, not when it's convenient, but all the time, every time. When you have the toughest time loving yourself, Follow that commandment. When you have the task of loving the most un unlovable that's in your life, that's when you love them the hardest. It says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. 1423, John 1423. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make them a home for them. Home with them, excuse me. John 1510. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. 1 John 2, 2, 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. I've, I've got more. But we obviously know that the if we follow these commands, if we follow his commandments, we're going to be, we, are, we are doing exactly what he has asked us to do. We are following him. We reap rewards from following those commandments. However, there are warnings in the Bible about not following his word or his commandments. In 1 Kings 9, 6, it says, But if ye shall all turn from following me, ye or your children will not keep my commandments or my statutes, which I've set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I gave them and this house which I have hallowed in my name and I will cast out of my sight and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among the people. If you're not following his commandments, if you're not following his word, if you're not following him or following his word by following him, then you... It, basically says you'll be cut off. If you start doing your own thing, you're going to have consequences for it. And I know just like you, I pray each day. I pray for peace in my life, or I pray that, you know, maybe my world around me is quiet, more quiet than the chaos that I live in, or I pray for a, a more simple life. What am I really praying for? Maybe I should be praying for the strength to do what the Lord has for me, to, so that I can obey his commandments that, I had, that, that are in my life, so that I'm following his will. And wouldn't that bring the peace and that quiet from the chaos? Wouldn't that be really what I should pray for? If you think about it, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing every moment of my life, obeying every commandment, that means I'm following him, 
And if I'm following him, I am serving him. So anyone who serves me follows my commandments, but they also follow my example. You saw the little bracelets, just do it. You know, that, that's, what, you know that's what we need to do. We need to just do it. Follow that example. Every Christian is supposed to be Christ-like. And you know, I, I really wanted to go get a big old tall sunflower and just set it over here and have my little sunflower seed to, to show up. So we're going to pretend that up here is this like five and a half foot uh, sunflower, the big old bright yellow, and a whole bunch of sunflower seeds stuck there in the middle. And we'll come back and we'll bring, we'll, I'll just distract your attention with our sunflower. You guys can't see it from over there, can you? It's right here. We'll come back to it, though. Because if I were to take the sunflower seeds out of it, right, and I threw them down into a garden somewhere, what would I get? Good. Very good. Because, yes, just like the, the parent plant, I'm going to grow exactly what that is. I'm going to get more sunflowers from it. So if you want to be like Christ, you have to do the things like Christ. Oh, you saw where I was going there with that. You know, when Trey was a little boy, he, uh, he, had, he, he imitated people and, and things. And one of his favorite people to imitate was uh, Anakin Skywalker from a great movie. Anyway, and uh, he, had this, he had this vision. And I don't know if you guys remember, the ones that have been in church for a while. He had this vision that a Padawan learner had a tail, had a uh, 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 it was his own thing, I'm telling you. It was on the show. So he saw it, and he had his little tail. And it was all draped down through here. And, and so he was imitating Anakin Skywalker. Now, I was, I'm a geek. I admit that. But I'm not the biggest geek because I didn't know the whole story behind Anakin Skywalker. And some of my friends did, and they kind of put the story together for me. And I realized that it may not have been the best example for him to imitate. But... He decided one day that he was no longer a Padawan learner. And we caught him in the mirror cutting his little tail off. We have that little tail, that little hair tail, and Mama's got it in a scrapbook somewhere. But at the proper age, he was no longer going to imitate Anakin Skywalker as a Padawan learner. He was now trained, and he is now some sort of, I think, a... Uh, Maybe a Jedi at this point. I don't know. Any, anyway, he, he was imitating him. And, and, you know, it was a bad example, I know, because Darth Vader, and, you know, and he becomes Darth Vader. But anyway, at the end, you know, he, Darth Vader jumps in front and saves Anakin and comes to the light side. Nobody, huh? We have to be sure we're imitating the right thing. Even the Antichrist is going to be an imitator, Right? He's going to be an imitator of Christ. It's, he's going to have that, that anti-Christ title. He's going to imitate Christ. He's going to imitate him through worship, worldwide dominion. He's going to imitate a throne. He's going to get the tendency to, to initiate. Every, everybody's uh, 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 going to look for, at him and imitate Christ. And they're going, to, they're going to do all this. He's going to do all this through satanic powers, empowerment. But he's going to try and imitate Christ. So we have to kind of be careful. You know, I probably wasn't the best to, to let Trey imitate Anakin Skywalker, but we do have to be careful. In Daniel 8, 24, it says, He will become the Antichrist very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause outstand, uh, a standing destruction and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. So we have to make sure that we are imitators of how the people, of how people... <laughs> Let me rephrase that. We need to make sure that we're not imitating people in church or what we think we've heard the Holy Spirit or, or making, making sounds that, that, that we think. It, we need to imitate the right thing. We need to be imitators of Christ, walking, talking, thinking, loving like Christ, like that sunflower that's over here. You know, if I pulled the seeds out, planted it, it would grow up more sunflowers exactly like the father plant. We want to make sure that we do that. And Paul even says, be imitators of me because I'm going to be an imitator of Christ. And in Ephesians 5.1, it says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. 
The Christ life has two aspects, knowing who we are now, right the second in Christ, and then living out who we are. In that second aspect, we exercise our will. We have to determine what we will and what we will not do to live in the conformity of God's will. The call to imitate, imitate God is a call to work out or live out our lives in this way. We have to follow Christ's example, which is the exact opposite of what the world's example is. And I brought this, I brought this scripture one time to Brother Keith, and, and, and I was just all fired up about it. Ephesians 3, 17 through 20 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you be filled with the fullness of God, and now unto him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think according to the power that worketh in us. And that scripture popped off the page to me, but I was not reading the King James Version, and I'm not telling you you're reading the wrong version. I'm just telling you that if you break this out in the Message Bible, whew, I don't know, it just pops out. So I'm going to break it out a little bit for you. It said, may Christ through your faith actually dwell or settle down, abide in your permanent home, in your heart. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. That you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp all God's devoted people, the experience of that love. What is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth of that love? How wide it is, how tall it is, how deep it is, the breadth of it. That you may really come to know that you practically, through the experience of yourself, not somebody teaching it to you, not somebody, somebody showing it to you, the love of Christ which surpasses mere knowledge. Without this experience, you won't be able to, you won't be able to grasp it that, that big of love. But you have to be able to experience it personally that you can be filled with all your being until the fullness of God that you may have the richest measure of divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. And then it says, now unto him in the consequences of the action of his power that is at work in us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far above above all that we dare to ask think inf infinitely beyond our highest prayers desires thoughts hopes or dreams now that is a reading of that scripture you have to let the faith of Christ in you to make a permanent home rooted so deep in that love of Christ that it's so founded securely that nothing can rip it out. You are firmly on the love of Christ. You have the power of Christ strong enough to grasp it not only mentally, but grasp it spiritually, the height, width, length, and depth of that love. Are you getting this? That's how deep this is. To know that in your heart, the experience that you've had, that you've experienced in that love, so that you know that you know that you know that you know that it's real, that Christ is real, that the love is real. Not because someone told you, not because somebody wanted you to hear this, but you know it yourself. You know it because you've experienced it yourself so that you can be filled so much from the head to the toe from top to bottom, side to side, your being is so filled up, your fullness of God, it's the fullness of His divine presence just pouring all over you. Your body is so completely filled. You're at flood stage. You're pouring over. You can't add any more to it. That's flooded with all of God Himself right there and then. And now, right now, not later, not tomorrow, but right now, Knowing that you, who you are in Christ right now, you, say me. Everybody say me. Come on, say me, because you know I won't stop. Me. Right. That's right. You have experienced his love and filled with God so overflowing, which, has, which was done by him, knowing that now, having the power of Christ in him, I am able to do exceedingly more. You are able to do exceedingly more than I could think, imagine, or even dare to ask, which is infinitely higher than our prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. It is now you are in Christ, now that you're following him by example, because you know he loves you, because you know 
what he's done for you. You know he's bought you and paid for you. You know the experience is true. And you know that the height, width, and depth of that love is so 100% all about that love. Nothing more, nothing less. What he did, he knew, Christ, did, Christ knew the Father fully and walked in that love so boldly that he gave you that exact same power to be an imitator of Christ. Do you got it? You can be an imitator of Christ. That scripture was just poured out for you. You can be an imitator of Christ right now. We could stop right there. We could, uh, I mean, I, I really could. I, we could spend a whole bunch of time there. But I've got a couple more for you. We know, you, to serve, you must follow Christ. But what we also need to know is when you serve, that you must be where Christ is. And to serve means that if you're where Christ is, that you should be there too. Where, there I, where I am, my servant is, a, uh, is there also. For the exact opposite of how the world runs things. My boss does not want to be around me after he's assigned me a project. He says, go do this. I break it out by people, by project, by things, what we got to buy, blah, blah, blah. And I give the direction. My boss is nowhere to be found. And funny thing is, is about 14 years ago, I started with Perfect 10. I was sitting in an interview process, and I was going through this, all this. It wasn't, didn't seem to be going too well. And I stopped the interview. They're asking me about all this stuff, and I was like, hold up. You know what? It's really sad that these days there's not that, that, uh, that master and, and uh, an apprentice relationship in work anymore. That we can't... I, I can't come in here and you guys just teach me whatever this trade is that you want or teach me whatever Perfect Ten does and, and I just absorb it. Because back in the day, that's what they did, right? You, a master had a skill. What doesn't miss? A, a silversmith, a goldsmith, whatever. And he built, he did his smithing or he did his, his stuff. And to get any time off, to get anywhere away from the business that he's created or to retire, he had to have an apprentice build him up so that he became the master. I thought things were going horribly at the time and ended up leaving that, uh, leaving that, uh, that interview really feeling bad, called Amy and said, well, get the newspaper out, look for more interviews on Wednesday or whatever. And uh, in the middle of that, I hang up, I get a phone call, it's the company. They say they want me to come work for them. And not part-time, not full-time, I mean, not part-time, not under staff mark or anything like that. They want me full-time. I said, what will I be doing? They said, I don't know. They just really liked your attitude. <laughs> Here I thought I blew that, that, but it's a long story, but before we can step out and do our own work for the Lord, there's kind of a training program you have to go through. You have to be willing to stay in touch with that moment that changed your life long enough to finish the training and perform the skills the Lord has for you. We can't learn everything by reading books. We have to be willing to step out, serve the Lord, and do His will. And at that moment, the Lord of hosts, the God of angels' armies, directs our path with His will and guides us. Do you see that? He's not pushing us. He's not pushing us. He's walking beside us. He's guiding us the way we, we are. He's, he's teaching us. He's the master. We're the apprentice. He's the master. We're the disciple. And we're truly serving God, doing his will. Then where he shall be, I will be too because I'll be his servant. It says we the church, we're, it, if we approach it like that, then we're going to be the ones that are under Little Rock looking for the homeless and, and looking for the hungry, giving clothes to the poor, sending youth out to serve community, our elderly, the broken, or the widow. The king will, the, the, in Matthew 25, 34 through 36, it says, The king will say unto his right hand, come, to, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was na naked, and you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. That was the first scripture that I ever did anything with because Pastor Husky asked me to do a devotional in Ecuador, the first mission trip we'd ever been on, the first devotional that I had ever heard on a mission trip on my first mission trip, my first scripture. I don't know if I'd get, get in the first in there. So we have to, we shall be there doing those things. And you know what? You know the rest of those scriptures. Because what did he say? He's there too. So not only in that, in that way do you have to be there, but when you're feeling that loneliness in your life and you're wondering, well, 
why am I even serving God? Why don't I feel him? Why can't, why isn't he here with me? I don't feel him. I'm serving, but God doesn't seem to be in it. I mean, I, I could be wrong. But when I get the feeling this way, I get depressed. I think all over me, I sit around, I sulk, I lay around, I mope, I have my own little pity party, and it seems as though I'm not moving, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm just, I'm not moving forward at all. Maybe, just maybe, you're not following the God, God's example he set by his son. First off, if you are walking with Christ, a, that's how a blessed man would be walking with Christ. Psalms 1.1 says, A blessed man who walks not in the counsel of the godly, ungodly, stands in the path of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. You're feeling humdrum from serving, or you feel like that God's not with you in your ministry? Be blessed. Don't walk, stand, or sit in the situation. Run to Jesus. Run to him. Now, Newton's first law of motion states that an object of motion tends to stay, remain in motion. Object at rest stays at rest. This law applies to people, too. Some are naturally driven to complete projects. Others are kind of apathetic, requiring motivation to overcome this inertia, this laziness, a lifestyle for some, but it's a temptation for all. You know, Jesus was always on the move. He was always walking in the next person or the next thing to do for his ministry. He was ready to serve his master, and he kept on moving. Maybe the reason you don't feel that God's around you any longer is he's moving forward, and you're lagging behind. It is a temptation for all of us to be lazy. But uh, Proverbs says, The sluggard craving will be his death because his hands refuse to work. Sluggard or the lazy man loves sleep. As the door turns on his hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. The sluggard says, There's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. I can't get up and go do anything. He wastes his time and injury. He who is slothful is in his work is a brother to him who is a great waster. All those are from Proverbs. It says Proverbs is a lazy person, but he has a servant. Diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. He becomes a, he becomes a servant. Lazy becomes a servant, but he becomes a servant to man to try and, and to make up for that. We know that not serving a sin is, is, is a sin in the Bible. If that says in Ephesians 2.10, we are prepared in advance for the work we are called to do. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It is our salvation that when we're saved, that changes us from serving ourselves or serving man to serving God. Ephesians 4.28 He who has been stealing from, must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may be, have something to share with those in need. He'll carry you through the tough times if you let him. He'll guide you through the temptations if you let him. He'll continue to be by your side if you let him. But there's much work to do, and he's constantly moving. The question is, are you constantly moving with him? If you don't feel like Christ is around you anymore, maybe it's because you stopped and, or started walking. Maybe you sat down on the job so when you serve Christ is where you are and you me are where Christ is I am where Christ is because that's what I'm doing I'm serving and Christ is with me I'm with him so we go down we're on our third third part of this scripture I am not going to run out of time you guys have been faithful thank you because the last one it, it, I'm going to, I'm just, I'm pumped by this last one. It says, when you serve, you'll be honored by the Father. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. As Christians, we know that our labels will be rewarded by our Lord if we preserve in diligence. Let us not become weary in doing good for the proper time when we reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We work with our heart. Whatever you do, work with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance for the Lord as your reward, it is the Lord Christ that you are serving. It's Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And Hebrews 6, 10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him. 
as you have helped his people and continue to help him. God, will be, you will be honored by the Father because the Son has asked him to. The Father rewards us with being a blood-bought part of the family, a sonship with all the rights and roles of the first son. In this crazy old world, it's an honor, though, that allows us to call out to him and say, Abba, Father. We have that personal connection because the Son allows us to be honored by the Father. We're, we're honored by, uh, by him by being able to be called his beloved Son, another personal connection that Christ allows us to have and be honored with. And we're being called a good and faithful servant in which he is well pleased. Another personal connection. And Christ is allowing us to be connected to God in this personal way. And he's going to reward, he's going to actually say to his father, look at Steve, my good and faithful student, servant. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So I'm going to repeat what I said at the beginning of this. It is a symbiotic relationship between the two, saved and, and serving. You are saved so you can rid your mind of those self-promoting thoughts. You're saved so your heart does not have that selfish will of its own, but the will of the way of the master each and every day. That the will of the master and the will of Christ, that's the salvation. Born again with a new mind and a new heart. If you refuse to serve Christ, then you can't be saved. Therefore, if you're serving yourself, walking in self-service, being simply, uh, simply you're being a servant for the world or a servant for Satan. There's only one way to be delivered from this self-righteous, self-serving, self-willed mindset, and that is to be saved, which means you will still serve, but instead of serving yourself, the world, or Satan, you serve Christ, right? When you serve Christ, I want you to remember these three absolutes. When you serve, you must follow Christ with your action, your word, and your deed. Ministry commands an example. When you serve, you must be where Christ is, physically doing the work by his side, but spiritually living the life by his side. And when you serve you'll be honored by the Father. And what a day that'll be, right? What a day that'll be. I love that little that song. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace the one he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness or pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. Lord, we thank you for opening our hearts to this word that you have for us. We thank you for just directing and guiding us and allowing us to hear your word that what a servant is. Lord, I can't wait for that day that you, that you do take us through that promised land. That would be a magical tour, I swear, of that promised land would be beautiful. A tour of a lifetime. You know, Lord, sign us all up for that tour. Sign each and every one of us up, Lord. Lord, just be with us as we leave this place. Strengthen us to do your work. Encourage us to walk beside you, Lord. And Lord, just... Just give us that, that protection that we need, that hedge of protection around us, Lord, as we go through the, this week, Lord. 
as we go and, and we fight for you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Until the next time that we're in your presence again. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.